Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Taking Jeff Goldblum to Life Aquatic. Willem Dafoe to Aquaman. Nicole Kidman to Dead Calm. Sam Neill, Hunt for Red October. James Earl Jones to the Swashbuckler. Finally, Robert Shaw, Jaws. Just when you thought it was safe to say that you thought it was safe to go back in the water, Tom, Josh, Dan, dive into six films anchored by six different actors, swimming us all the way to the summer blockbuster that birthed summer blockbusters. Jaws. Six films, six actors, six weeks, three guys, one podcast. The Fire Pivot. It's going to be a Jaws dropping summer trip. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws. None of man's fantasies of evil can compare with the reality of Jaws. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus, Jaws. See it before you go swimming. Uh, hey, Josh, you on? Yep, yep. I am just, yeah, getting set up. Are you ready to start live testing? Yes. Hopefully the training data was good. It needs to work this time. Hopefully. All right, here we go. Good evening. And well, fire spilled. Forward. Cast. Ha, ha. And that did not work as well as I had hoped. Yeah, still really buggy. Can't replace Tom with that. Okay, let me try this. Good evening. Well, come to the fire pit pod. Cast. Ha, ha. Tweak the harmonics a bit there, Josh. It's still we're still getting a little uncanny valley. Ah, damn it. This worked better on my machine. Um, okay, one second. Good evening. Welcome to the Fire Pit Podcast. Ha ha Uh better? Uh I maybe we don't try to use it so much tonight. Yeah, that plan seems to have gone down the toilet. It's still incredibly broken. Well, I mean, we can creatively hide Tom, you know, like they did with the shark and Jaws. What do you mean, like, just have him pop in here and there for random one-liners? Exactly. Just here and there. There he goes. Well, let me try something. The Last Jedi was a terrific movie. Uh, shit, maybe not. Still definitely broken now. God, it's getting dumber. Hey, hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. Yep. Hey, oh, shoot, we're recording already. Nice. All right, so what's the plan for the show? What we got? That was better? Still not too happy with the cadence. I'm not selling it for me. You guys doing a thing now? What's what's going on? What are you doing? Now it's just speaking nonsense. That was really odd. I didn't run anything. I thought the movie in episode four, Pathfinder 2007, was the height of our viewing experience. Was that me? Was that... Uh-oh. Oh, shit. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Hello, bots and listeners. Welcome back to the fire pit. I'm Dan, British name Nigel, and tonight we finally go into the water. Although I think we've kind of been in water this entire list, but that's not important. It's a very important milestone for the podcast, however. The second major destination stop, as you guys remember, after we got off the road to Independence Day, we decided to get sauced on the Sink or Swim summer tour. And uh, we stayed the course in these stormy waters. And if uh, last week's episode was any indication, it was very stormy. As per the rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them here. And to tell us what we're watching and who we're watching, 
I'll send it to Thompson. Well, thank you as always, Nigel. I'm Thompson, American name Tom. And last week we watched Robert Shaw do something in Swashbuckler with James Earl Jones, who was our connection from the previous week's Hunt for Red October. <clears throat> Excuse me, The Hunt for <coughs> Red October. In hindsight, we probably should have watched that one twice. But, you know, no dwelling on the past, no crying over spilled water water pun tonight we see a much better robert shaw performance and as a much better pirate in a much better film as he is quint in jaws the classic steven spielberg debut film about needing a boat that's bigger or something uh, i mean it's, it's a weird film no one's ever heard of anyways but we'll find out just like you will and to give us a rundown of that film i give the mic to you reginald oh uh, thank you tom thank you tom hello i am josh british name reginald and yes tonight we are watching jaws here we are at the apex of the sink or swim summer tour and literally in the belly of the beast so Jaws itself was based off of a 1974 no novel by Peter Benchley of the same name. Jaws, the name of the book, not the name of the uh, author. I just realized that. Now Jaws, the movie itself, was released June 20th, 1975. And uh, it was directed by Steven Spielberg. But Tom, and I uh, don't want to do this, but I'm going to tip my fedora and I'm going to go ahead and say that this actually wasn't his first big film. It was actually his third theatrical release film. But his film that came out the year prior had a budget of $400. <laughs> so it wasn't a very big release. This was his definitely his big coming out film, so to speak. It had a budget of $7 million. And what I love about that is in 1975, the box office was a very different place. So opening weekend, it made $7.06 million. Now, it's cumulative 1975 gross, or no, it's initial box office gross for the year 1975 was $133 million. The number two movie that year was um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and that made like $60 million. I was going to add that to my notes, but I didn't for some strange reason. I think I got caught up with trying to figure out why the box office reporting started really heavily in 1980. It was computers, by the way. Over the years, the cumulative box office gross for Jaws has been $471 million. And fun fact, half a million dollars from this year alone due to uh, the resurgence in popularity of drive-in theaters for Obvious reasons. So Rotten Tomato score, it got a 98%. And IMDb, it's got an 8.0 out of 10. It stars Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, as we've are, we already know, Richard Dreyfuss, Lorraine Gray, and Murray Hamilton. Now, fun fact about Jaws is it is the first summer blockbuster. It set records not only on spending, but box office gross, total income, which at the time, it was totally unprecedented. Studios considered the summer as a graveyard for movies. And they were and typically over the summer, movies were released, were considered subpar, and they didn't expect them to turn a profit. However, Stevie Boy Wonder Spielberg and Universal changed that by making a groundbreaking movie and spending about two and a half million on marketing, respectively, which was, again, unprecedented at the time. And as I mentioned before, this movie was based on a book, making it the Fourth film in the Sink or Swim summer tour based on literary characters. Or fifth. It's the fifth film, right? Because yeah, we established yes, the yeah, uh, swashbuckler. I... Boy, if that was a boring movie, can you imagine what that book was like? Anyways, continue, I Josh. I, I imagine that they maintain that uh, it's it's going to be like one of those movies that didn't really follow the book. Yeah, I don't think any of us here really cared that much about the film to yeah, check read out the book. The book. Yeah. I did do some reading uh, regarding, because I was curious, like on Box Office Mojo, which we typically get all of our stats from, there's only one film that reported for all in 1975, and that was Jaws. But it's like, you look, there's not really a lot of, like the earliest film they have was 1922, or not 1922, 1922 was the year Variety started reporting box office numbers. Mm -hmm. But it, even in 1980, which is when typically, air quotes, the box office start, numbers started to become more accurate, at the height of 1980, only 5% of theaters nationwide was reporting box office numbers. It really wasn't until 1983 that we started to get accurate numbers like we have today. So if you're saying what I think you're saying, Jaws might have actually made more than was reported by history. Hypothetically, yes. Or it was one of those movies, like in Star Wars in 77, that it was such a big deal that people cared about the numbers. So more theaters were like, yeah, look how much money we made. Because another fun fact, Jaws 
was only released in, okay, I don't have the exact number, but I know it's less than 500 theaters nationwide, and it made $7 million. Yeah, and then they opened up the gates, right? And they opened, they, they put it in a bunch of theaters, right? I was just looking at opening weekend. Like the first 10 day gross, it made $21 million. So I don't doubt that they opened it up, but I didn't look at further weeks, yeah. so I can't tell you. Well, I was adjusting for inflation. And if you adjust for $1975, Josh costs seven million to make, which is about thirty-three million dollars in today's money. And its initial box office, not opening weekend, the initial box office, you have it listed at one hundred and thirty-three million dollars. That's about six hundred and forty-one million dollars in today's money. So a movie cost thirty-three million and made six hundred and forty-one million. Yeah, that that's a low budget film in today's Hollywood. Wowzers. And like even thinking of this, I think I was looking up average ticket prices for 1975. They were less than two dollars. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're thinking a 33 million dollar weekend, which is by some movie standard a good weekend. Like obviously not a summer blockbuster movie, but that's 33 million dollars over like 450 theaters. Yes. Yeah, I'd love to see the tickets number sold and then adjust to based on current inflated movie prices because it that number's got to be way more well mm. i think a lot of this is something we don't see too much today uh those numbers have to be people going to see the movie two or three times yeah i was about um, to say that that was another big thing about this movie is a lot of times people would see the movie and they really wouldn't care to see it again but this <laughs> is the one that really started reviewings like people would go and see it multiple times per weekend or per week Right. So, I mean, seriously, Jaws broke a lot of ground. It did. Oh, big time, yes. As, as a former film major for all of one year. Um, we know. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of history, Jaws just changed everything, like you said. Yeah, this, is, this isn't just a great film. This was a historic landmark of a film. At right yeah, place, right like, time. Oh, yeah, it set all the records. Every single record it set and it broke up until 77, which obviously Star Wars, when that kind of solidified the summer blockbuster. Because we all know 1976 was not the movie for summer blockbusters. Nope. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it is kind of weird to see 75 be this foundation of the summer blockbuster in Jaws. And then 1977 is Star Wars, and that solidifies forever. The summer blockbuster as we know it but 76 was like that limbo year that old hollywood was still kind of there you know because swashbuckler is definitely an old hollywood style movie and i wonder if because 1976 was the united states's bicentennial that a lot of studios just didn't care because i i wasn't alive back then obviously but my parents told me that 76 was almost like a one-year celebration of the bicentennial and that almost everything that was around at the time was kind of a celebration of that so i wonder if movie studios just didn't put a whole lot into building on what jaws laid down until the following year after the bicentennial hoopla was over that's just a theory in my head i have no basis of that there, there's i've not seen any numbers that that correlate that theory that's just a a thought i have it's if, if that, yeah, that could be I, I have a theory that just came off the top of my head since we're pitching them what, what, what if jaws was like the equivalent of motion controls like when the wii came out it came out in what was it 2006 so the xbox 360 and the ps3 like none of those had motion controls except for the wii and then the wii came out and everybody's scrambling to get motion controls <laughs> Microsoft pushes for the Kinect, and PlayStation is doing the what they call it, the PlayStation Move or whatever it is. The years following was a transitionary period. Uh, kind of like the how everyone's trying to mimic the Marvel system, and everyone, yeah. yeah, 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 they didn't have the system in place, so it's just like, shit, 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 what are we doing? We're, we're making another film about... Cancel it, we gotta okay. do it this way. Yes, have you not seen this shark? I want a shark, give me a shark. Yeah, it's like, so everybody was like clamoring to replicate the uh, success of Jaws, so 76 mm-hmm. was just kind of a low gear because everybody, everything was still in production. That's my theory. And again, like Dan, I have no basis for that. I literally just came up with it as I, he was mentioning uh, the sev- bicentennial theory. I mean, both probably played a big factor. Though, listeners, go back and listen to our previous episode about Swashbuckler, because you'll get our full thoughts on that. Please. Episode 17, by the way. That's episode 17. Thank you, Josh. Um, <laughs> now I've lost my thought. Damn it. But you saw that they did try. The advertising was very heavy on that film. They made it seem like this big thing that you should take all the kids and the family to see. I'll 
blockbuster, if you will. Didn't quite work, but you, you saw they were getting into it. But yeah, the year after that, boom, baby. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to picture the summer as being a graveyard for movies. Mm. Like just, just kind of a period of throw it out there. If it makes money, great. If not, oh, well. It's like all um, those sci-fi IPs that you want to see movies for, but like Ready Player One. All these cool, air quotes, cool movies that just don't seem like they're going to do very well. Although they did put some muscle behind this film. You had Roy Scheider, you had Richard Dreyfuss, both of whom um, were not, they weren't, I don't think they were quite A stars. Richard Dreyfus has been, my IMDb isn't loading, so one of you guys are going to have to look up what their history was before this. But I know Roy Scheider was in, he was definitely in uh, The French Connection, which I yeah. think came out before this. So he was a thing there. Was he in Running Man? No, he was not in Running Man. Well, Running Man would be the mid '80s, anyways. That would be yeah, yeah. Movie. That was like nineteen. No, not Running Man. Um, the the one where the dental and um the Nazis. Marathon um, Man. Marathon Man. Thank you very much. Yeah, he was in that film because he gets killed. Spoiler alert. That is so hilarious that you bring that up. <laughs> Also, Tom, too, uh, since you said it wasn't loading, uh, Richard Dreyfus had mostly TV credits to his name before this movie came out. Really? He was, however, yeah, he was, however, in American Graffiti, which was kind of a big deal in 1973. Oh. He, I don't I wouldn't say he was a named actor, but at the time of Jaws, he was definitely an up and comer, so to speak. What about Roy? Because now you may It looks like I'm he wrong. was acting from I got his up. He started in TV in 1951. Kind of looks like he got out of TV starting in 1969. Mm -hmm. He did Stiletto. And then it looks like he was, had a bunch of roles, named roles in movies. And a couple of TV show appearances, TV movies, up until uh, Jaws. But none of these I recognize. So take that with wow. a grain of salt. Oh, no. yeah, wow. You got to remember back then, too, like it was almost considered a quote unquote promotion to go from television to movies. Um, yeah. You did not you did not see actors go back and forth. In fact, if you left TV and went to movies and then went back to TV, it was kind of implied that you failed as an actor or even go from movies to TV. It was almost considered a demotion. Remember back in the 90s of a TV show got or 80s and 90s of TV show was popular enough. You're like, I hope it gets a movie. Like Power Rangers, perfect example. The TV show got so popular that it got a movie. Totally unrelated to the show, just had the same actors, but mm -hmm. it got a movie, and that was so yeah. big. It's like, oh, that's awesome. I'm that curious now. Um, could one of you guys look up Spielberg's um, credits? Because this is, I mean, I you're that. saying that these Dude, guys... He was not, like I said, this was his first big movie. He did uh, shorts and commercials, and a couple or TV shows up until then. Like, he had three movies uh, under his belt and one of those like i said came out the year before it had a budget of like four hundred dollars or some shit here let me see if i can pull it up here i know our uh listeners love us just reading from imdb okay i'm just gonna go down his directing list from 2020 west side story 2018 ready player one i'm gonna stop that was, that was, I was following it. Like, <laughs> it'll be here um, all night yeah. He was in shorts. But, uh, he did a lot of yeah. shorts. He did a few episodes. He did an episode or two of a couple TV series in Columbo. the 70s. But yeah, his uh, first movie was a couple TV movie, a couple TV movies. Then he did the Sugarland Express in 1974 and then Jaws. And then after Jaws, yeah. he was, you know, we're looking at Jaws and Close Encounters in 1941, then Raiders of the Lost Ark, then E.T. My God. Yeah, <laughs> like, his, his yeah, the eighties was good to him. The eighties was as, good to us. Steven as soon Silver. as Jaw as soon as Jaws takes off, he is just close encounters, forty one, Raiders, E. T. Twice uh, then Temple of Doom. Wow, yeah, he just he hit his stride pretty good after Jaws. So we had an uh, a relatively unproven director, main actors that had some T V credits and some bits here and there, and a misbehaving mechanical shark and everything that could go wrong and this film is the benchmark for what would become blockbusters holy shit i gotta sit back for that one that's impressive not also i did not know this. john williams no go ahead go ahead no john williams is way more important than anything else yeah. <laughs> he's, awesome. he's amazing the, the, the sound of hollywood right there the music of yes. hollywood is john williams yeah the day he dies will be the day music dies you know this generation we got to experience john williams so i, I don't know where that is in relative to this thing but i mean that it's like i know spielberg and lucas were good friends and they went to uh i almost said movie college 
<laughs> <laughs> they went to school studying movies together. Like they think they both graduated like nearby each other. But uh, and then John Williams was there. I actually think that George Lucas got a recommendation from Spielberg. Hey, pick John Williams to do Star Wars for you. It'll make him better. It'll make it better. So this is yeah. This movie is literally. I want to say, Dan, you 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 could use the term prototype for the summer blockbuster. But I remember when I was looking at that, I felt like that wasn't the right term for it. But mm-hmm. it is so the right term. <laughs> John Williams, Steven Spielberg, summer release. That just sounds like every popular movie in the 80s. Yeah. So this is effectively, yeah, I think prototype is actually a really good term to use. Mm-hmm. But it's just like the prototype worked so well. Because as we saw with Swashbuckler, they didn't quite have it fine-tuned just yet. But then Star Wars hits, and then boom, every mm-hmm. summer in June and July is your major movie. This is your tentpole film. This is the big movie. This makes us all the money. This gets everyone to the movie theater. So we have this as a prototype, Swashbuckler, the beta, and then Star Wars was the final release. Yeah. yeah like, so I, Star I, Wars I, was version one. Episode one. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Don't. Not cool. God damn it, Tombot. <sighs> I thought I shut you off. Um, I would like to ask, I know that all three of us have probably seen this movie in some capacity at some point in time, and most of our audience has probably seen it. And if you haven't seen it, one, what are you doing? And <laughs> two, what are you doing? I mean, hey, seriously. Hey, hey, don't be mean to our bots no, here. No, no, some no. of them were programmed yesterday. They haven't quite, quite caught that's, up. That's true. No, seriously, if you haven't seen this movie yet, well, it's it's a different type of movie than we I know we call it the the first summer blockbuster, and it's a lot different than how we we came to know blockbusters. But it's still such a good film. But anyways, all three of us have seen this movie in some capacity. Most of our audience has seen this movie in some capacity. I am gonna ask though, you two, and I'll start with Tom. What are you hoping to get out of seeing it tonight? Well, from my end, just a very historical appreciation for it unknown actors unknown directors underdog story this was rocky before rocky in a perfect place perfect time perfect storm it, it really was just the changing of the guard between hollywoods part of me wants to go into the whole history but there are youtube videos trust me listeners go online look up the changing of the guards from new hollywood to what we consider contemporary hollywood and it really does start with jaws we're 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 literally watching a historical moment playback and also just real quick before i turn it over to you i just occurred to me as we were talking universal pictures was known through most of its history for its monster movies and of course one of the things that gets it back into the limelight is a monster movie small appreciation there but reginald what about you uh what am i expecting to get out of this one god it's been so long since i've seen this movie and i i, I couldn't even tell you how long it's been since i've seen this movie all the way through but yeah, I'm, I'm very in- interested to see this, especially after doing all the research on it. Like, it's one of those things. It's like, did I know this before I read this type thing? Because this seems eerily familiar. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to you know watching it and being able to appreciate the movie again because this is a good movie. Like, what movie did we watch recently that was older and it established a lot of tropes? Oh shoot, Nigel, you have to help me. Was it Dead Calm? calm? Possibly For... Dead Calm? Uh... Yeah, it must have been Dead Calm because it was so boring and just we'd seen these things so many times. Yeah, it was. It, yeah. Was, it, was, it, was, it was Dead Calm because we'd seen it so much in other yeah. films. Two episodes back, bots and listeners. Episode, episode 15. Thank you, yes. But uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to like seeing this movie and kind of, you said, look at it through a historical lens. So I'm curious to see how it's going to, how different you'll see it. And really quick, I definitely wanted to make sure that this was said. You're, probably, you're not listening to this on Friday, but recording this on Friday. And I don't know what Dan did, what he sacrificed, to what God he's did to, but we're watching Jaws on Shark Week. So, bravo, Dan. Bravo. I honestly did not plan it this way. I only wanted to do Jaws because I was we were talking about summer blockbusters, and I was like, let's do the first one. Yeah, and we planned this eight weeks ago, two months ago. So we had no idea when Shark Week was. I only happened to stumble upon that while randomly surfing the internet the other day. The stars have literally aligned for us, gentlemen. Beautiful. Nigel, what about you, my sir? Well, I'm kind of like Josh. This movie starts a lot of tropes and a lot of 
I guess, cliches that we are now so used to that they might seem mundane in this movie. But unlike Dead Calm, this is a film where there's a reason why these became tropes. I don't know. This is such a landmark film. And it sounds so cliche to say that, but it's such a landmark film that I really want to see the beginning of the, what we now consider to be modern Hollywood. I know at the time it was called New Hollywood. Now we call it, you know, it's more it's this modern style of filmmaking. And being a huge fan of Spielberg and most of his movies, I kind of want to see his first dance again. I haven't watched Jaws in a long time. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie in its entirety, not on TV, meaning not a TV cut with commercials or TV editing or anything like that. So I kind of want to see and pay attention to his first outing as a major director and maybe see why he became, well, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, that's that's mostly what I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. I'm just looking forward to seeing the first big Spielberg outing, the first big outing with um, John Williams in the score. And just, I want to see that prototype summer blockbuster. When was the last time you'd seen this? Oh, jeez. Ages ago has been the last time I've probably seen it in its entirety. I've seen Hunt for Red October more recently, not counting our recent rewatch of it. It's been a while since I've seen this. I can't remember the last time I've seen Jaws. I know not too long ago I watched one of the crappy sequels, but um, it's been a while since I've seen this. Say, the last time I saw it was um, actually Gateway here in uh, Columbus. I don't think it's every year, but two years ago they had it on like 35 millimeter. And I got to say, if it ever comes back to theaters, um, knock on wood, we are going to make a sojourn because you got to see it on the big screen. It's just, it's meant to be in that magnificence. I, it's a great film. I know I'm going to enjoy it. There's there's not an if and or but about it. I've seen it a hundred times, 101 times. It's still going to be amazing. Nice. All right. Well, Dan, if I uh, heard correctly, I believe you have some trivia for us this week i've i've got a little bit of trivia and it's in the form of a little bit of a quiz and i'm going to just do four questions and with um the four questions i'll um i'll give a little bit of trivia with it so or once we get to the answer i'll give a little bit of trivia with it's what i should say so so the first thing i wanted to ask is this movie became an old shame to someone who was involved in it who is that That they grew to they grew to regret this film. Reginald, I'm gonna let you have the first answer. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um that is a terrible question with no multiple choices. I hate you. I'm in the military. If I don't have multiple choices, I don't know how to answer a question. We're doomed. <laughs> um let's see. I would have to say, just looking at various careers and whatnot, Richard Dreyfus, because he went on to do mostly dramas. I don't think he was in a lot of horror based films or big blockbusters past this one. So that'd be my guess. Richard Dreyfus. Um Robert Shaw, swashbuckler. Actually, it's the writer of the book, Peter uh, Benchley. Peter uh, Benchley actually grew to hate this film. He claimed he regretted writing the novel, which led to the movie because he believed that this movie furthered fear of sharks to the point where they were overhunted and driving almost several species to extinction. He went to his grave being a vocal advocate for ocean conservation and just hated everything about this movie and actually hated it so much that he took a one-time payment for any subsequent sequels for Jaws instead of taking any royalties for it. Yeah, Financially he, speaking, that probably was a smart move. Those films did not make much. Well, no, he, he thought the sequels were dumb ideas anyways, but he hated the, the film so much. He enjoyed it when it came out, but he grew to hate it because of, of the what it did to sharks. What, yeah. it did, what it did to sharks. So you know, yeah. I want to say I knew that. That's one of those things. It's like, did I know that before? A lot of people think it's Steven Spielberg that actually grew to become a ocean conservationist because of what this movie did. No, no, it's the writer of the book, Peter Benchley, not mm. Spielberg. I yeah. knew somebody did, but I didn't. I couldn't. I wouldn't have been able to tell you it was the writer of the book. So I'll be honest on that aspect. Speaking of sequels that he hated. Now this Josh military man will like this. This one is multiple choice. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of these movies is not a sequel to Jaws? Jaws 2, <laughs> Son of Jaws, Jaws the Revenge, or Jaws 3D? Son of Jaws. Uh, yeah, Son of Jaws, because Jaws 3D was actually a thing. Yes, Son of Jaws is the only one not a sequel to Jaws. Uh, the others are... 
Oh, the sequels. Uh, only one of the sequels starred Roy Scheider, who fucking hated it and only did it because he was contracted by Universal to do it. And apparently when they were doing, I think it was Jaws the Revenge, they asked him to come back and do it again. And he hung up the phone on him and then he wrote him a letter saying to kill off his character. So they killed Bro- they killed Brody off off screen in Jaws the Revenge. And actually Roy Scheider turned down Jaws the Revenge to make a movie about a helicopter that was awesome. Or that he wanted to do. It just wasn't that big of a hit, but it wasn't Jaws and other Jaws sequels, so Roy Scheider was happy. He didn't even want to do Jaws 2. He thought the idea of a sequel to the movie that has such an awesome ending didn't need a sequel. And he was right. That, that's an, I guess that's another point uh, against this film. It was the start of the blockbuster and also kind of heralded in the shitty Block- sequel sequels, to the blockbuster. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, Pandora's like, box right there. It's, it's the double-bladed sword. You get the good and the bad. Like the information yeah. age gives us the world's information at our fingertips, but it also gives us flat earthers yes yeah (laughs) whoops uh and then the last trivia question or the second to last trivia question i'm sorry is what doomed ship in the navy did quint serve on i'll take this one the intrepid you want to i don't even have an idea um i'm gonna go with the intrepid this way if tom gets it right we can at least be tied well, you have one of the letters right. It was the Indianapolis. The Indianapolis. Damn it. <laughs> damn it. Damn it. Damn it. I was like, oh, it's the one that the Voyager class ship is named after. It's like, no, oh, that's a different World War II ship. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> Although you're you're close because uh, in Star Trek Voyager, Captain Janeway was from Indiana, so you were you were in the ballpark there. You were just you were in the wrong side of the field. Nerd. Do I get like, do I get like a quarter of a point because I was in like a, the zip code? I, I got a. Hey, you know. hey, hey, if you get a quarter of a point, I get a quarter of a point, so it doesn't count. No, 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 I answered it first. No, it doesn't no, matter. No, nope, no. Nope, I nope. totally meant it that way. Nope. Janeway was my. Damn it. Never. All right. Nigel, <laughs> ask us question number four. All right. And the last one is there's a scene in the movie that is not in the book, and it's a very big scene. What is it? This question is not fair because no one here has read the book because, I mean. It's... But I know this answer. Okay, go ahead. No, Reginald, you go. <laughs> Fucker. I knew you were going to do that. I was like, okay, go Tom. Go Tom. Go Tom. No. Nope. Um, I'm going to go with them saying we're going to need a bigger boat. Damn it. He's technically right on that one. Too. Yeah, right. he, is, he, yeah he, is, he is technically right on that. That, <laughs> that was an ad lib from Roy Scheider that Spielberg loved and kept it in. So, yeah, Damn, he's technically right. No, the explosion when he shoots the um, air thingy and it blows up the shark. The original ending was the shark when he's in the boat, the shark's coming at him. It just dies from its wounds and dies. Oh, well, I didn't know that. That actually wasn't the answer to this question. It's uh, <laughs> it's actually when Quint is drunkenly telling the Indianapolis story of all the men being eaten by the sharks in the water. Basically, that story or that, that scene was born from the fact that the shark had so many mechanical problems, they were waiting around again for it to be fixed, and Spielberg wanted an additional couple of scenes so that he wasn't wasting time while the uh, shark was being repaired, and Robert Shaw was in character and started to tell the story of the Indianapolis. So Spielberg started to take it from the top and recorded that whole scene. And that actually becomes the most dramatic scene in the whole film when he's doing the whole Indianapolis story. Such a good scene, especially mm-hmm. when Dreyfus's face just melts like drunk to sober in half a second. God, it's been so long since I've seen this movie. I don't even remember that scene. You guys are getting me excited. I want to see this movie now. <laughs> <laughs> right? So do we technically both get points because we were both technically... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you both points for that one. So, All right, Tom, I will uh, go ahead and concede this victory to you because uh, I think you were more right on the Intrepid, and I totally stole that because I had no idea what I was guessing. So <laughs> I will give this one to you, Tom. I will be the bigger man, and I will hand this one to you. So I am and- the bigger man. I am the bigger man in this. And by giving you and accepting defeat, I am the bigger man. Somebody shine the light and tell him to wrap it up. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as a better man, I accept your gracious defeat. Thank you. And on that note, gentlemen, we have started this journey with a shark hunt. Let's end it with a shark hunt, shall we? Yes. Let's say, yeah, we're about to watch a movie about the most dangerous thing in the oceans and a shark. Mm, I see what you did there, because man <laughs> is the most dangerous monster. Yes, clever. I know, I totally didn't steal that from a like, Twilight Zone episode. On that note, Tom, play the music. How was that? Was that natural? That was uh, 
Okay, you shouldn't work. be the one introducing it. <laughs> Tombot is my creation, goddammit. Okay, do you want to introduce Tombot so he can do the... <laughs> you, know, you know, Tom, I thought you would be more offended by the fact that we were trying to replace you. But all in all, you seem perfectly content with it. I don't no, know. No. Wh wh why is that? Well, it's because, well, I'm thinking about this, Josh. If he's going to take over the recording, he's also taking over the editing. That's that's at least 12 hours of my life I'm getting back right there. So well, No, 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 Tom, Tom. You're still editing because me and Dan ain't going to do it. Just the Tombots, just, you don't have to come in and record with us. That's right, bitch. See? Make me sound pretty. Exactly. See, nope, I'm nope. very, very good. Like, I, all I gotta do is type something in. Like, here, check this out. Episode one was a understated masterpiece. So, no, see, no, no, I cannot have that associated with me. No, it's that dark oh, this, slander. I cannot. This is only version one. This is only version one, dude. Tom, I'm gonna be able to have entire alliterotica presented with your voice. How terrifying that is! That'll be on your Google search. Like, people will Google your name. That is going to prevent you from getting jobs. Don't fuck with me. Twilight. Oh, what search engine optimization is. Twilight deserves a prequel. No! <laughs> Josh, Josh, I'm putting my See? foot down. Right? This is too far. No Science further. has gone too far. This is where it starts, and I will not have this. Oh, oh God. Well, this no, you really know Tombot's gone too far when it really enjoys Paul Blart Mall Cop. <laughs> the sequel was <laughs> superior. Take that, science! Ha! Yeah, my computer is on fire, and it's a virtual machine too. So I, I take that how you want to, but <laughs> my computer's sure. still running. But yeah. I think Tombot's dead. Oh, sure. hang on. I got one thing. He can do the transition. Tom, play the music. <laughs> and now it's dead. Now it's dead. Uh, welcome back to another of yet another episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and personal shipwright, Tom. And I can assure you, the ship, just the right size. Well, this is our last stop on the Sink or Swim summer tour. And it's honestly one we've been incredibly excited to reach, and we're all incredibly glad that you could join us. Now, hopefully you've been enjoying us ramble on about these movies. Maybe we've inspired you to watch a few of them. Or warned you enough away from watching some of the others. Either way, we just hope that it's been a fun trip. And no ads this time. But what say we peek below decks to see how the team is faring on this stop. I love the diversity in this scene right here. Especially for 1970s diversity. I mean, look at that hair. Um, yeah, you got blondes, you got... You slightly less blondes. I mean, the 70s were a progressive time. Fun fact. He actually mistyped this. That was Steven Spielberg doing the typing because Roy Schneider does not know how to spell attack. These facts could be true. You just don't have any way to validate them. I guarantee you, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, Josh, that all of these facts are so very wrong. This is always a good idea. Get a bunch of rednecks going out trying to hunt something. This is exactly what would happen if this would happen today, too. I never realized this until someone pointed it out. This whole scene was done in one shot. So you have to wonder how many takes it took to get. You know, you mentioning it, that is, this is actually really impressive in that, that regard. Acknowledging it, because you can't cut this scene. If you cut anything, it will be obvious. So you got <laughs> to think, like, at a certain point, it's like, fuck, I fucked up that line. Can we can we swing it around? Nope, nope, we gotta go to the end and then come back. God damn it, you do this every time. This is the ninth take and you charge us every time. Bob, seriously. God, I love this movie for the women in swimsuits. <laughs> Veto. Veto. <laughs> they get on the boat and what do they find? A dead Sam Neill trying to fix the engines. <laughs> uh... <laughs> No, they find skeletons of people watching Swashbuckler waiting for it to get to the point. I'm literally naked right now. 
Uh, apparently yes, Robert Shaw turned down the role at first because he didn't like the script and he thought the book it was based on was boring. And then they sent him another script and he read it and then he found out he owed money to the IRS. So he said, okay. <laughs> so did the shark just like kill all the people and steal the boat? I don't get it. That line right there was improvised. No, not every line was improvised. Oh Tom, boy. Yes. Tom, edit all of this out. Oh, you want to know some more useless information? No. no. Jesus God! Oh, Parental is guidance is suggested. Oh shit! That was a whole leg. You can't tell, but he pissed his pants. He wore his brown swimming trunks. It's like okay, fun fact: the guy who made that. Uh, We're done. That was a real scream. Shit! Shit! Cut! Stephen, cut! Stephen, for the love of God, cut! Cut! It is actually eating me now! The machine is alive and it is trying to eat me! I hope he knows he has to unmute himself from Skype, because you can't unmute somebody once you've muted them. Yeah, we'll let him figure it out. And this guy right here holding the wheel? Damn it! Damn it! <laughs> damn it! Ah. Smile, you son of a bitch! And thus, the block... Buster one-liner was born. Where's Quint? <laughs> oh, bits of him here, bits of him there. Um, over there, over there, yeah. He went to go film Swashbuckler, so it's going to be amazing. Narrator, it wasn't. <laughs> Good Lord, this movie is 2020 in a nutshell. I know. Very oh precious. Oh, my God. <laughs> Whew, yep. Looks like we have this one well in hand. But if you have anything you want to say, or to pay us to say, feel free to shoot us a line at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Put in the subject line whether you have a question, comment, recommendation, an ad you want added, and tell us what's on your mind, and you can go to bed knowing that you will never have to look for a response email from us ever. In these trying times, it's good to know that you have at least one thing to count on. That email again, curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. But I see the shore, so it's time to head into port. Thank you for joining us on this trip, and as always, good luck. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago. And it went straight to my head. Ba-doom, boom, boom. Come along, fellas. You know the words. The live shark footage. Filmed by Ron and Valerie Taylor. Ah, filmed in Panavision. Edited in Cleveland. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all night. <laughs> all right, all right, Josh, you want to take the summary section? Sure. All right. So we just finished Jaws. Let's see. This movie is um, obviously about a shark, but... It starts off with effectively a group of young white people partying at the beach, getting drunk. And then dude trying to get some, chases a woman out to the sea. She gets eaten by a shark, um, as it is. But then obviously people try to figure out what's happening. Then it goes into, there's a beach. Kid actually gets eaten. So it's not as uh, dramatic as, you know, dead comms kid getting thrown out the window. But the kid does get eaten, which I got to respect that much. And uh, some political mongering goes around. Um, one to open up the beaches, whatever. Nobody gets killed, but there's a false alarm. Like somebody cries wolf. But then the shark still shows up, kills another guy guy and totally freaks out Roy Scheider's kid and then they decide to go out to uh, the ocean and hunt this shark with uh, Hopper, um, Hooper. Quint, and yeah, with Hooper, Quint, and uh, what's Roy Scheider's character's name? Brody. So the three of them go out. It's like maybe the last third of the movie. Um, it's just the three of them out on the open water and they're just hunting the shark. And uh, there's a lot of instances where they shoot barrels into the shark to try to keep it afloat from going under, but it still sinks. A lot of dramaticness. Eventually, Roy Scheider freaks out, or doesn't freak out. He uh, basically tr trashes the boat, trying to get the shark near shore. 
and the boat dies. Hooper tries to go underwater, almost dies when he's in the shark cage. And then the shark basically lands on the boat, eats Quint, and then gets blown up by uh, Brody as the ship is fully sinking and then Hooper appears again. That is a, a terrible summary of this film, but that is the summary of this film. All in all, a very basic plot, but very well done. Well done. Well done also on your part, Reginald. Very succinct. Am I on mute while I'm applauding? No, no, you're there. You're there. I'm just crying inside. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is an, an unusual case of the more troubled the production, the better the film became. Wasn't that the entire Wrath of Khan too? Shorter budget for that, but like they, they literally cut the budget to nothing. And they're like, make a good movie. So, or uh, another thing is um, Sam Raimi in uh, the Evil Dead movies. Like he had a shoestring budget, so he did the best he could and made those movies. That's why or Evil Dead Two is basically a remake of the first one. Mm-hmm. But it's like he had a shoestring budget. It's like, but then you give him a budget and his films are garbage. That's a, that's a way with some of these auteur directors and such. They just, they know what to do when they're starving. But when you give them a buffet, they just go overboard and they hurt themselves and just make a mess. I.e. the this, original trilogy versus the prequels. Yes. yes. But this one right here, it still amazes me. This was a perfect storm of a film a director and a crew that just refuse to let the troubles they, they refuse to let the gods stop them it's like defying poseidon himself to make this film and it did all right but jaws gentlemen redefined cinema as we know it yes yes what an amazing film. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie in its entirety, uncut, and I Still some... holds up. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get started with those post-movie thoughts. And Nigel, okay. since you were the first to say it, I am going to go ahead and pass the buck to you. Okay, so I'm going first tonight. Uh, well, I'm just going to say, wow. Just I know that it's not as action-packed as n- newer action films, I know that cinema has kind of moved on past Jaws, but my God, this movie still holds up today. That whole last half an hour where they're on the boat hunting the shark is still incredibly tense. Yep. I have to agree with a point you made earlier, Josh. I don't mean to steal your thunder, but if this that movie had been made today, there would have been 10 men on the boat. Nine of them would have died. <laughs> Each death gorier, gorier than the last. Also, there would have been about four sharks. And then they would have been using a M1 Garand rifle and a couple of barrels and a harpoon gun. They'd have been using a machine gun and depth charges and shit. So what, I mean, this is a good, this movie's a perfect picture, perfect example of why less is more. They had so many problems with the mechanical shark that they had no choice but to improvise it with ways of like showing the barrels floating on the water, minimal shots of the shark, trying to show it from above, like when they would show it, like when it attacks that group of the boys and that guy on that little mini sailboat. And you would kind of only see the shark underwater because it was kind of hiding some of the flaws the mechanical shark had, but it still looks so fucking menacing in that, in that shot. Less is more. We don't need to show the sharks. The sequels show the sharks all the time. They're also bloodier and gorier. And yet mm-hmm. this one is so much better. I didn't realize this. I was actually keeping account in the movie. Only like five people died in this entire film. Yeah. It's a horror film. It's a thriller. It's a, it's an action movie, but only five people die in the whole movie. The girl at the beginning, the little boy, the guy on the mini sailboat on the beach, and then uh, Quint. So and four. Uh, four people died. I'm sorry. Four people die in the whole film. And a dog. Oh, yeah. Five if you count the dog. The dog? Yeah, because there was a guy with yeah, the dog. Yeah, another dog. I, I, I have this feeling I'm missing somebody. The little boy. Oh, the, the guy's from the boat. The boat that they found in the middle of the thing. But oh, they didn't okay. show that death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so but there's still only like four or five deaths in the whole film. Whereas the other movies double the body count and double the, the amount of time you see the shark and all that. And they're not near as good. Like, I don't know. This movie's just, it sounds so cliche, but they really don't make them like this anymore. I don't know. I just, I loved so much about this film. I can see why it became such a big hit. I can see why in film school it's still studied to this day. And I can see why Spielberg became Steven Spielberg. 
the camera work, all that stuff. But I'll let you guys have some thoughts too, since uh, I don't want to steal what you guys might want to talk about. So I'll kick the can back to Reginald. What do you think, bud? Well, um, yes, this movie, it's God, it's been years and years since I've seen this all the way through. It's like one of those things is like, I think I have memories but of this movie, but I couldn't quite piece them together to fully coalesce that it was this movie that I was watching. Like, I remember that scene where Brody was doing the thing with his son and the hands and the mimicking. And it's mm-hmm. like, I couldn't have told you that was from Jaws. It's been so long since I've seen this movie. But yeah, this movie is, they don't make them like this. Like you said, they don't make movies like this anymore. But at the same time, I don't think they ever made movies like this when this movie came out. This was the first. It, obviously, it's a summer blockbuster. It was the summer blockbuster. And the thing about it is, it's like it's still slow by, if you want to say by today's standards. But at the same time, the pacing is just perfect. Mm -hmm. Like they start the movie off with a death, a fairly exciting one. You know, it's like, oh shit, what's going on? Literally nothing is shown. But, But they start off with that and then obviously slows down. Um, it's definitely a character driven movie. And the music is so suspenseful. It's so creative in the way they do hide the shark. You can't really compare it to modern films because they're so natively different. I can... Kind, kind of, sort of. I think it establishes why John Williams is such a good composer because of the way he can score mm-hmm. a film and do that. You really don't see too much of that these days, and the ones that do really stand out. Mm-hmm. So... It's like that one scene um, after the false positive when they cried wolf and then everybody cran inside and then tom pointed out that they don't play the music so it wasn't the shark it's like you're you're worried at that point but you're not that worried because something's missing but you don't acknowledge it and then mm-hmm. suddenly the music starts playing and you're like oh shit it hit that it elicited that emotional response this movie does a great job of fucking with you in that regard banging on the side of the boat um robert shaw going crazy and basically blowing up the boat stranding them out there br- busting the uh the radio mm-hmm. yeah it's just i want to say i have more collected thoughts as i was thinking about this but i don't know this movie was just really good classic yes is, classic you watch this movie and you're like this isn't one of those overrated films mm-hmm. one of those movies that everyone tells you is a classic and you watch it and you're like huh yeah or- this isn't polarizing at all either Mm-mm. it's like it's hard to watch look at this movie and be like yeah that's a bad movie i hate that movie yeah, I mean, I think maybe for its time, it could have been uh, chided as being over the top. But com- that's compared to most of the films at the time. This, for me, I said in the beginning that this was a landmark of a film. And it, watching again, it, I see it even more. This was definitely a transition sort of film there there was a period during this point where we had new hollywood like we had gone away from the big uh studio system of films like cleopatra and all of them where it were smaller stakes very personal subverting expectations and what in the films we consider now contemporary where it's like large scope very major payoff that sort of thing this was that fading into the new phase it was still a very personal film the scope was small you had an auteur director like Steven Spielberg who played so well with the camera that um I had to look it up to see what it was called but the uh the dolly zoom which a very hard trick to pull off I, I was almost showing off the one on the the boat he had a very concise vision but mm-hmm. it's still it felt like a big film it felt huge and I'm losing my train of thoughts. I want yeah, to gush so much, so much to this movie, you know? Yeah. This film's template is in so many. You In modern suspense films, in modern monster movies, modern action film, a little bit of everything owes itself to Jaws there. This, this was the film that would eventually bring us Star Wars and Top Gun and Days Indiana of Jones. Thunder and Indiana Jones and... And just everything else that we would come to know and love. Yeah. You know, I'd like to touch on, uh, go touch on again, how, you know, we said that less is more and then mm-hmm. how sometimes we analog directors with their, their famine versus feast. I think you gave the buffet analogy there, Nigel, mm-hmm. but, no, um, Thompson did. Ah, well, whatever. Um, but <laughs> it's, it is apt to point out Steven Spielberg was not a one hit wonder. No. So it's like that shows that his creativity even flourished 
what's the word I'm looking for? Well, uh, con- confined. His creativity was confined. Mm-hmm. He was able to pull this movie off. Literally an Academy Award winning film. The highest grossing film of its, I don't. I can't say of its era because Star Wars came out two years later. But it was the highest grossing film of the year. Academy Award winning. Because this won Best Picture, correct me if I'm wrong. Did it I'm, win Best I'm Picture? I'm like 90% sure that it won Academy Award. It had to have won something, Guys, at least. For won three score. Best Editing and Best Film Sound, or Best Sound. Won best picture. It was nominated for Best Picture, but it lost to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Okay. And oh, there's wow. actually a video of Steven Spielberg losing his shit and getting pissed that he wasn't nominated for Best Director. He wasn't nominated for Best Director? Anyways. No, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little flabbergasted too. No wonder why he fucking flips a table and gets pissed. I would too. I had to deal sure. with a shark, a fucking robot shark that wouldn't wow. work and almost killed one of my lead men. And I don't even get so much as a wink. Fuck you guys. Also, I was today years old when I found out that Robert Shaw wasn't nominated for Best Supporting Actor. That is kind of nuts. Wow. He didn't even get nominated for Best Supporting Actor. That's amazing. What? It just goes to show you. It just goes yeah. to show you that sometimes the Academy doesn't always get it people no this well, does yeah, explain why when he won his academy award for uh saving private ryan why he just kind of walked up flipped everybody off dropped the mic and walked off stage that's a lie actually, he didn't actually do that actually i don't think he won for saving private ryan he did i'm, I'm checking right here best director saving private ryan oh did he oh cool no. i know he, oh, he won best right. picture for schindler's list it didn't win best picture uh, saving private ryan lost best picture to shakespeare in love that year yeah and everybody because was pissed and there's, still a, pissed about there's, there's a video of as soon as they're about to announce the uh winner steven spielberg's about to stand up because everyone figured saving private ryan was a shoe in to win best picture that year and then they say Shakespeare in love, and he's got this look on his face like, the fuck? <laughs> like, what? I thought you just nominated that movie to be nice to him. <laughs> I remember that. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he won Best uh, Director for in the 99 for Saving Private Ryan. He won Best Picture and Best Director for Schindler's List in 94. I mean, that was a, yeah. that was a powerful oh, film, too. I, I just mean. realized that this is also one of the only franchises that Spielberg started that he had nothing to do with the uh, sequels. He remained a pro- he directed the sequel to Jurassic Park and has remained a producer on all of them, including the Jurassic World movies. He's directed all of the Indiana Jones sequels. Yep. yep. But he had nothing to do with Jaws two, Jaws three D, or Jaws the Revenge. Of course, he that kind of makes sense. Those that like, uh, from my understanding, he was hired to direct this film. Like, he didn't pick it, and he didn't want to direct it because Steven Spielberg is very much the type of person who, especially after the success of this film, was like, "This is an awesome IP. I'm going to make a movie about it." And then he would go and he'd make a movie. Like, Ready Player One is a perfect example. He's like, "This is a awesome book. I'm going to make a movie about it." And everybody's like, "Okay, Steven. That and they offered Jaws to him, but he turned it down to go direct Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And being a young director, I can kind of see why he did that because, again, this isn't the modern Hollywood. This is back then. Hollywood had a tendency to typecast even directors. Yep. So if you if you were good and had success with monster movies, that's kind of the niche you kind of found yourself in. You were always directing monster movies. If you were good at drama, you always directed drama so i think him turning down jaws to go direct close encounters of the third kind is a, a good idea on his part actually and i don't think it would have made jaws 2 any better no, if he'd no, been the director would. also and, he was the writer on close encounters yeah so, so. but I, I can see why he wanted to do close encounters he didn't want to be typecast into only doing like monster movies or man versus beast movies and now we can look back on his career and realize that that was the right decision because spielberg has directed everything from monster movies to comedies to drama science fiction so yeah, people forget he directed movies like war of the world ai mm-hmm. the movie that wouldn't end yeah. <laughs> um, i mean you can't really forgive uh an, an artist uh, their la- their latter day sins i mean he did bring us a minority report which was pretty darn good mm-hmm. yeah i mean the guy's a very smart very good director and he's very capable but yeah we're all gonna have our own duds if my uh humor tonight is any indication of that <laughs> that's the I most thought, real laugh i've gotten all night i thought you were funny josh <laughs> hop 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 See? Turn it off. Twenty-five percent of us agree. Hold on, I'm, I'm, turn, I'm turning it off. I'm Josh, turning it off. I, I, I am. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> okay, that one's going right out to the dumpster. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I'm just saying uh, this movie was a good window to see just how Steven Spielberg became Steven Spielberg. It's just, yeah, it's got his fingerprints all over it, but it's got his prototype fingerprints because, like, you, I can some of the camera work in this movie. He like improved by the time he did Indiana Jones and or Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the actiony sequences, he kind of tweaked them a little bit when he did you know, saving private Ryan and all that stuff. Like you can see where he was like, this is his, um, his first outing, but uh, God, this is really good. I, like Tom said, what was that scene? The the second shark attack when Roy Scheider's character stands up and the camera moves back from him mm-hmm. instead, of, instead of zooming in, it zooms out. And you said, that's a really hard shot to pull off. Yeah. The dolly <laughs> zoom. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think the only person that had ever really done that shot before him was Hitchcock. I think with um, Vertigo. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the most famous scenes in cinema. How many times have you seen that scene of Roy Scheider standing up real quick and then the oh, camera yeah. pulling back on him? That's just one of those scenes whenever someone, whenever they're yeah. showing Jaws or something like that, that's usually a, a scene that they lead with. It's got a lot of weight to it, even out of context, you know? Oh, yeah. That's how well it's directed. That scene is directed. And honestly, I don't think we give enough credit in this movie to Roy Scheider's acting in this movie. He sells that character of just being oh, yeah. pants shittingly scared, but still doing the right thing. He has moments of like the whole, you got to get a bigger boat or you're going to need a bigger boat. Oh God. Scene. When he turned around and saw the shark, like he was a, uh, what did Tom say that he was a stand in for the audience? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like, also, you know, we saw that we were shitting our pants. He was shitting his pants. We commiserated with him in yeah. that, that, that scene. Yeah. Also, oh, I thanks. just realized, I just realized that when the shark, when he's throwing the chum in the water and he's got his back turned to it and the shark and jaws shows up in the scene, that's the only time you see jaws without the theme playing. There's no, yeah. lead up, there's no lead up to jaws actually showing up. He just shows up. He pops out of the water for a second, but the theme is not playing. So it's definitely a moment for the audience to go. <gasps> like, yeah. hey, Nothing prepared you for it. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I want to I want to keep talking about this film. I'm not going to lie. The fact well, that this is our uh, apex. This is the end of the tour. So if this mm. like ID four was a uh, hour and a half long episode. These are the benchmarks. These are the ones that we work towards. So, but, but that's what we do. we're watching. We want we're watching these quote unquote classics. Although I'm sorry, Independence Day is a classic. Um, we're watching these classic films and we're seeing why they're classic, why they're so good, why everyone seems to like them. Young people, old people, uh, you know, fans who watched this movie when it first came out and fans who just didn't discover this movie until 25 years later. It's such a good film. And there's a reason why it stands the test of time. Yeah. Yeah, You know, and all three of us agree that a film is good, that it's probably going to be a good film. I mean, we are nowhere near the benchmark critics to go based off of. But no. if you've been following us up until now, I mean, we don't have a lot of movies that the three of us all agree is a good movie. Well, Off the top of my head, I think we liked ID. All of us liked Independence Day. All of us liked uh, Top Gun, um, yes. the right stuff. I mean, there was a bunch of movies, Apollo 13, but two of us liked Aquaman. I think all three of us liked Life Aquatic. Yeah. None of us liked Dead Calm. No, no. We all liked Red Hunt for Red October. Yes. Nobody likes Swashbuckler. No, no. With all of those films we liked, we could still pick out um, a pretty decent amount of things that we saw wrong, we didn't quite agree with, yeah. you know, like uh, this, that, and the other. We might have enjoyed it, but what we agreed it wasn't really a good film. This is, we could nitpick this film, but we'd have to try. This oh, was yeah. not, we don't just, we don't all just agree it's a good film. We agree it's a great yeah if i was to nitpick one scene in this film i don't particularly care for is the scene where they uh they catch the tiger shark and the mother of the boy that was killed comes out when it comes out and she's still wearing her funeral garb i don't know the actress that's playing her but that that scene her acting is not good in that scene it's so wooden and so forced and it's just not great, but that's me really looking for something to yeah, be like. Yeah, you'd have to be look. I mean, at the same time, you could even just sign that off as the woman just lost her son. She's going to be completely irrational. Yeah, and yeah. She's going to be incredibly no, distraught. I'm, in character, her actions made sense. I'm talking about the yeah. actress's ability oh, to. No, I'm even that. saying, like, you could even construe her acting yeah. as such. Like, I'm just, if you're going to hand wave it. But I think you'd, <laughs> I, you'd have to be nitpicking if you're really going to do that. But I do agree with you, Dan. 
Mm -hmm. I don't even think she was an actress, really, because I know that scene where she slaps him, that, that was an actual slap because she didn't know how to slap. So that could have explained it, too, either way. But, yeah, we'd have to narrow in on, like, tiny bits like that. Or the guy where Pooper's telling him, it's like, that's a tiger shark. And he's like, oh, what? That, that was the best take, really? That was the one you kept, Stephen? You didn't just cut it out? It's, yeah. But that's, I mean... Great film, classic. And no scene, agree with, do you guys agree with me that we we pointed out while we were watching this that a couple scenes had to be filmed extra because the short course wasn't working, but they never felt like padding. They still felt like they served some purpose. Like, even with Roy Scheider's characters at the dinner table, he's just like holding his head. He's like, Jesus, God, what am I got myself into? And his kid's like next to him, just mimicking him. It's like, it's just a quiet scene. He humanized him. It's. Yeah. Yeah. And then it transition to the next scene where Hooper comes over with the wine. Levity felt light without being forced, like modern Marvel films. Something serious happens, and then, then someone makes a fart joke. What are your At thoughts least on that? in like post Disney acquisition of Marvel, yes. Yeah. Specifically, I, I, I Thor. Yeah, I I agree. Thor Ragnarok is one of the only Marvel movies where the the humor really takes me out of the story in quite a few scenes, and that upsets me. But that's a different rant for a different day if we ever get to that yeah. food, uh, movie. But um, I agree though, Tom. With not just that, Tom, not just the forced humor, but we talked about the scene with the shark attacking the boat. And there's only three of them on the boat and only one of them dies. Quint's the only one that dies. And then that's even, it still takes like 10 minutes to kill him. Whereas Josh mentioned while we were watching it, if they filmed that scene today, there'd be 10 people on the boat. Nine of them would die. And then I said, there'd probably be about four sharks that have just one. Well, they didn't, they try to make that movie with a Megalodon. The yeah. Meg. Yeah. Like, let, let's, let's make the shark like bigger and let's kill more people and make some very unrealistic science. And you're like, it's, this isn't, no, it's again, less is more, less yeah, is more. Yeah. You know, you don't have to show things to make it scary. And it had a great effect because uh, I was reading that after this movie came out, beach tourism died for like two years. Um, <laughs> people, people would go to beaches and that, we're not talking just beaches on the oceans either. Lake Michigan and all that were having problems getting tourists up there. And sharks can't live in lakes. <laughs> uh, you, you still today, people see this film for the first time. It's like, dude, I couldn't even take a piss. I couldn't go near the toilet water. Might yeah. have been a shark. I remember being a kid seeing this movie and actually being legitimately afraid of swimming pools for like a week. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I think it was an actor, NBA player, somebody who said that they couldn't, they, they had to sleep with the lights on for like a month after watching this movie. It's, it's just the power. Spielberg no, it's... knocked it out the park. He did. <sighs> Gentlemen, this has been an excellent tour. It has. Yes. It has. And I'm I'd hope... have to say that even though it was the sink or swim, and we had a couple of duds in there, I'd say overall this was a very fantastic route to Jaws. So uh, bravo, Tom. Bravo. Yeah, I would say it was enjoyable. Even with the Aquaman, that uh, was a movie that I enjoyed, but recognized it wasn't very good. Dead Calm was a movie I didn't enjoy, and also recognized it wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, the swashbuckler but swashbuckler gave me one of my best lines ever what is this movie yes so, yeah. even though we didn't like some of these movies we enjoyed making mm -hmm. fun of them to death. <laughs> it gave us good contrast too thanks to swashbuckler we appreciated far more the artistry that was jaws it's been a splash ha 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 uh, and I'm looking forward to whatever route we come up with next. Um, so which stay we'll... tuned for next week. We will have a double episode. Yeah, we'll have um, a special episode next week determining our... where our next path. Yes, yeah, so our selection section part three, where we will determine our next journey or whatever we're going to call it. We promise not to make this one as long. We're trying to refine the process a little bit. Yes, um, we are all only coming in with two. We don't um, want each one of our selection episodes to be an episode like Swashbuckler or Pathfinder where it's two and a half hours and nothing fucking happens. So yeah, tune in uh, next next week for that episode. And yeah, we'll let you know. We think we have an idea what we want to watch, but we'll, we have to tune in to find out and find out what we're going to watch to get now, there. We know what we're going to watch. We got to come up with our uh, route to get there from Jaws to uh, that movie in six... Six degrees. So, 
So Tune in Josh, to find out what it is, and well, we will. Uh, well, Josh, since let you you've know. already suggested and chosen our next destination, do you want to give the audience a little hint to where we might be going? Um, I really don't want to let them know what it is. Okay. Yeah, we don't we don't spoil it. Yeah. yeah we'll I, I don't I don't want to spoil it. All right, we yeah. won't spoil it for them then. Until then, this has been the Fire Pit. Find us online at Fire Pit dot podbean dot com podbean fantastic podcasting hosting site home to many many a great and of course us the longest lasting and highest rated fire pit <laughs> named podcast on the internet uh find us wherever a fire pit podcast might be uh, i think amazon itunes spotify google google, spotify, yep. google yes Find us in every one of those locations. Special shout out to Sync Lounge and Plex for hosting us tonight. And, and uh, hi, Mom and Peggy. Yeah, so. special shout out to Peggy, friend of the channel. Congrats on the new job. Happy for you. And uh, also happy to hear you're recovering. I'm glad you enjoyed Tom's rant about how Dead Calm offended him. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Peggy, as always. <laughs> And yes, no. my mom finally did download an episode. She downloaded two episodes like uh, a month ago. Never listened to them. And I bitched her out. <laughs> I'm like, I created this and you aren't listening to it. And she's like, fine, I'll turn it on when I'm cleaning or something. I'm like, that's all I ask, mom. That's all I ask. <laughs> And if you find she's not do, going to listen to him, so, I, so I'm literally <laughs> speaking this on deaf ears. So, <laughs> but on the off chance she does listen to one of these, thank you for joining, and thank you, everyone, bots and listeners, for joining. This has been the Fire Pit. I've been Tom, I've been Josh, and I've been Dan. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment LLC. Good luck out there. All right, good night. Thank you for listening. <laughs>